and I forgot to put the video on, so I don't even know where the video is.
Hello, and Hello. welcome to the what, Website Hello. Investing Show. Hi, Lois. Hi, Adam. How are you doing? Doing good, thanks. All good. How about you, Lois. Mark? What have you been up to? Been oh, ages yeah. Been on. I know. <laughs> yeah, luckily we do talk to you talk to each other off off stream. Otherwise, it would have been a while. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lois is a pro now. Like I don't know, I feel like I'm out of water now. Like, I haven't done this for so long. So wait. Be, 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 oh, be, I would not say I'm a pro. <laughs> we started the stream mark because you were joining and uh, I pressed live, and then uh, I forgot to put the video on. So for a couple of seconds, we were just uh, like, oh, the video, whatever <laughs> the video. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Definitely out of that. So anyone what that's not watching live, skip like the first three seconds because it's just me and Adam. Just like... <laughs> Stand all right. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Yeah. Cool. I'll check that out later. Good job you weren't swearing about me and stuff. Or maybe you weren't. <laughs> I'll have to watch it later and find out. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, go through a little bit of the housekeeping oh does it even here do you remember the housekeeping stuff mark no i'm just going to press some buttons and see what happens oh yeah if you're new around here then don't forget to <laughs> like and subscribe to the channel um put out content every single week uh, there's a podcast every week there's a live stream every week um so hopefully it's useful information um so yeah click the subscribe button for more uh if we get up to 35 likes today then we'll do a giveaway uh, on the stream for some merch mugs and t-shirts and all that kind of stuff it should be our service that's kind of old news now i guess it's not new but anymore if, is it if if you didn't know we've got a digital <laughs> pr service that you can kind of check out and we kind of crafted it specifically for niche website owners um and historically it's kind of been something that really big brands and stuff have done so uh, we've done that and um, made something affordable for uh, niche website builders too so if you haven't already checked it out check it out at niche website builders just on um, that note, i was in the the digital pr team meeting this morning did you know it's a uh, 0316 day today which is a uh, steve austin day i don't even know that's a thing there's so many different days of the week for different different things it's it's probably something every day of the year isn't there if you wanted it to, if you looked <laughs> Oh, there is. There's a website which tells you what's going on it, like every single day. It's and it's National Ravioli Day on Monday as well, just in case <laughs> any ravioli fans out there. <laughs> good to know. Fantastic. But those things are good to know if you're doing digital PR because you can tie in the pictures for that kind of stuff. That's why uh, it's not just a random pitch in Steve Austin day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so um, yeah, so today, well, okay. I mean, I guess we can ask Lois what she's been up to before we before we jump on. What have you been up to, Lois? Um, nothing. Very, very busy getting stuck in uh, with everything, website investing and stuff. So yeah, it's going good. Yeah. All good. Think it's my third live stream, I think now. So yeah. yeah, I might get used to them eventually, but yeah, I'm not a pro quite yet. But we'll get there. So when people start stopping you in the street and saying, "Hey, you're on Niche Web's build a podcast," <laughs> that's when that's when it all changes. <laughs> that's when I've made it. You know, that was when I've made it in life. The people of Caffili will know you by sight, Lois. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> they will. <laughs> so yeah, we've, um, yeah. Oh, gosh, I keep forgetting what I was going to say. But anyway, I, I guess let's just jump on with it. Shall we? I think we've got lots to cover today, so nobody wants to know what me and Adam are up to anyway. So no, it's fine. Boring. But um, today we're going to talk about EEAT or EEAT or double EAT, as the Google guidelines suggest you could call it. Um, but uh, yeah, EAT. So if, if, you, if you haven't been under a rock, you've probably become familiar with EAT and probably become familiar. There's a new E on the EAT too. So today we're going to we're going to cover that off. Um, we're going to talk a lot about um, all of the all of the all of the letters of the acronym, not just the experience, not just the new one. Uh, and talking about how, you know, things are changing. We've, for a long time, we've talked about making sure that, you know, thinking about your, your niche site as a, as a genuine business. And, you know, with with this EAT stuff that's, that's come out, it's been around for a while. I mean, Adam and I did a podcast, I don't know, like a year, 18 months ago when EAT first came out. Um, but, it, you know, you can see the direction that Google are going with it. And what with things like AI content and stuff like that, are only going to get more serious about trying to identify quality content and genuine sites. And so um, we're going to cover off some of the things you should be thinking about with EAT. Um, and also we're going to kind of 
talk a little bit about how we're putting that in practice, specifically with H domains. So, yeah, we'd love to talk about H domains <laughs> on this channel. Um, so we've been deploying some like tactics and stuff to, to, to satisfy EAT with our H domains. And we want to share that with you and, and some of the things we're doing, which is kind of different than if you're starting a site your own on a fresh domain. It's kind of it's yeah. a, lot, a lot of it is very specific to being an H domain, which I won't give away anymore. Um, but um, yeah, so we'll jump straight into it, I guess. So the handful title. <laughs> I know I wanted this to be the title of the YouTube uh, channel mm -hmm. but, um, of, the, of the show, but then uh, Luke said, oh, if you put death, so Luke's in our marketing team, if you put death in it, like you're not you're less likely to rank it. It's going to be one of those kind of words that <laughs> that YouTube, YouTube doesn't like. So, yeah. like, okay, well, that's fair enough. But, uh, yeah. but uh, you know, I can put it on the slide, right? It doesn't matter. It's fine. Um, so, yeah, don't neglect eating. It'll be a painful death. And it will for your sites. Got to take uh, things more seriously now. Why is it not? Oh, hang on. People can't see it. I haven't turned the slide. Have I turned it on? No, you're on the wrong. You were on the wrong one. You had it right. Oh no, good. I'm on teardowns. Yeah, that's right. I was clicking through the through the other slide deck. See, I told you I wasn't up to speed with this. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> hold on, hold on. Carl, Carl is keen for your cardigan, Mark. Keen on the cardigan, <laughs> Carl. I don't know why you're keen on the cardigan for. And this is identified it as a cardigan. Like it got accused of being a dressing down gown the last time I was on. So <laughs> <laughs> it'll be uh was it the guy the person wanted um, merch, didn't they? They wanted, they wanted a dressing gown merch. <laughs> time, so. Anyway, yeah, I think I was wearing okay. I've got two 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 different colours of this, so yeah. Oh, Carl can have one and you can have the other. You could be twin <laughs> twin in with the cardigans uh, when we go to uh, affiliate meetup, uh, affiliate gathering in New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. So, um, so I stole the first line from uh, Adam's slide later on, which when he talks about age domains, which is on a slightly different context. But where have you been? So, as I said, if you, now, unless you've been on a rock, you probably would have heard about uh, EAAT -E -E by now. And uh, for those that haven't, very briefly, and I'm not going to go into any detail at a high level what it is, but Google has introduced a new concept, EAT, which stands for Experience, Expertise, Authoritative ness and trustworthiness. Um, so Google uses EAT to evaluate the quality signals of a website. And like I said earlier at the start of the stream, you know, for a long time we've been saying, you know, you, it's time to start treating your your website as a real business. But now, like, really, is the time to up your game. Um, and you know, we've seen a lot of sites uh, getting uh, hit by Google updates over the last twelve months um, or so. Um, yeah, purely down to like quality related issues um, and eat related issues. So um, it's definitely time to start taking notice if it's not something that you've worried about too much before. I want to uh, credit Kyle Roof with um, a lot of this uh, content we've got here today. So obviously, you know, as niche website builders, we've been working with eat stuff for a good 12 months. Um, but if you follow a lot of the podcasts or video channels around um, in in niche website building, then you'd have seen Carl's been on the rounds uh, in the last couple of months since uh, the new E came out um, and talking about uh, EAT. And so some of the stuff in here um, is definitely attributed to him and the way that he thinks about and articulates some of the stuff related to EAT. So I just wanted to make sure that I was uh, you know, attributing to him to some of these ideas and, and, think, and, and thinking. So... First of all, I uh, just wanted to kind of mention like bots and eat. So in the early days of eat, and I don't think we fell foul of this. When we first saw the eat guidelines, we were like, oh, fuck, what are we going to do like for expertise? Like how, how are we going to even like prove that? And, and I think, you know, a lot of people start would start to think, geez, I've got to get like a doctor to start writing my content. Like, because, uh, you know, that's how I'm going to prove that I've got expertise. And, and really, that's just uh, not the case. You know, Google's got no real way of going, going away and with, it, you know, using the bots to go off and crawl off and verify kind of any of this kind of, any of your credentials you have. You know, you could have a degree, but like where, I don't know where, I've got a degree, but like where does it say I've got a degree? I, I can't like prove that in any way. So it's, it's really difficult for Google to go and prove it. And anyway, even if they could, like the kind of you know, effort that they would need to go to to kind of do that is probably like, not something they're kind of willing to do uh, just from a cost perspective, but kind of this stage. So 
it's not easy for bots to go off and, and, and verify those credentials. So really, they can only really try and identify your expertise, your, you know, your experience and all those kind of things from how, what you articulate on the page. Like I think the Yandex leak kind of really helped with this. So um, you know, Yandex, they call it the clone of Google. Um, I think there was some stat that said 70% of search results are similar, uh, the same as Google. And, you know, that is, I think it's well known that quite a few Google engineers went off the Yandex uh, when that was started. So it's, it's not surprising that maybe some, there's quite a lot of the ranking factors that are similar in there. Um, and when, if you, you may or may not be aware of the index leak, but you, uh, you probably probably are if you if you're serious about uh, SEO and, or if you if you've been in, for, in it for a while. But there's something like two thousand ranking factors that were that leaked um, from from the index uh, search engine, and because of their close similarities, it's kind of thought that actually a lot of these ranking criteria are probably very similar uh, to Google's. So. Um, Yandex is using something similar to uh, term inverse document frequency, so it's TFIDF, um, you, you may or may or not have heard of, um, but using something similar to that called BM25 to establish e e or, or to establish a lot of things about a page, but one of those things could be E criteria. Um, so I guess what I'm saying here is that, you know, I, I, well, I guess just to mention kind of what, T, what, what this what BM25 and TFIDF is, is that basically it just looks at a page and gets a sense of what the topic is about from, from put, extracting like important keywords kind of from that page. Um, and, you know, essentially that's, that's how it's going to establish kind of or work out kind of what is on a page. So not just eat stuff, but just what the topic is about in general. So it pulls them, pulls up the keywords and compares them to documents surrounding it. Does it mark? Is that how it works? Yeah. So within the that, yeah within a set of documents. So yeah. how how frequently does this keyword like appear versus its? And I guess it, would it be on? A, it's probably more on a topic level rather than an individual keyword. Would it? I imagine it would. Be. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's, it's keywords, but I think keywords make up the topic, right? So I think it's keyword yeah. level, but yeah. a collection of keywords that it pulls out builds a topic. Basically, yeah. <clears throat> so, I'm going to skip that because I think I pasted the wrong thing from the Google guidelines. There's a there's a few different places this appears, and I don't think I did. I did that at the last minute, and I don't think I did the right place. So I'm going to skip over. Um, but it, yeah, the Google guidelines. If you haven't checked them out, um, um, they're long, um, but you can. There's an index at the start or a contents page at the start where you can go through and kind of jump to the bits that are kind of relevant to you, and and it's, it's actually not too bad that that bad to read um it's got some really good examples in there as well um of how to to apply eat so um it's definitely worth a, a look at and it definitely gives some different examples for different kind of kinds of niches as well um so you can kind of go and look at very specific examples for very specific kind of niches um but a lot of this uh we're talking about here is kind of very kind of across the board kind of generic uh advice um but depending on the niche, you may want to go a little bit deeper into certain areas of, of, of EEAT. So I'm going to talk about experience. So as I mentioned, I kind of wanted to set that up as a precursor talking about the bots. It's very hard for Google to genuinely establish experience um, of somebody. So really, it's going to be picking up a lot of kind of what's written on the page. So what's the, the, you know, the length of time that somebody has been uh, you know, in, in an industry? you know, from a profile kind of perspective, but also the length of time maybe someone's had with a with a product if they're reviewing that product. Just kind of, kind of in general, kind of how much experience do they have with whatever they're, whatever they're talking about. Also personal experiences that they've had within the space. Um, maybe any qualifications they've they've got or where, where they've worked. And this really kind of, a lot of these uh, EA, EEAT stuff, each of them kind of overlap with each other. So when we're talking about qualifications and where they worked, we're really talking about a lot of trust signals. So I'll come on to that like a little bit later. Um, but, um, you know, the, you know, this is kind of what we're thinking about when we're thinking of experience. You kind of got to describe these things. You've got to kind of use the right wording around describing kind of your, ex your experience with a certain topic or with a product or, or whatever. So yeah, I think this it's really easy to kind of just, describe this when we're talking about affiliates so with affiliates 
Now, you want to really write the articles like you have the product in hand if you have a review, or even if you're writing an informational to uh, a topic. It's that, you know, you're not writing about it from the third person. You're writing about it from the, you know, I, this is what I did. This is the experience that I have. This is what happened when I tried this. You know, if you're using that kind of terminology, it very much gives an op the opinion that you've got experience, you're hands-on, you're using the product or the service or carrying out the task that's in that informational topic. So some examples here. You know, in my testing, I found whilst trialing this product, I found... Um, and, and, and look to try and find some unique points that are not prevalent like with other reviews because I think that's another factor that's going to show that you've kind of got experience above and beyond what everyone else is saying. You know, what you don't want to be doing is just saying the same thing that everyone else is saying in their reviews um, because that doesn't look like you've, you've got the product in your hand and you're using it because you've just imitated or copied stuff from, from other articles um, and, and, and pulled the information from there. So, <clears throat> so go ahead, Adam. I was just say interesting. I, I, I think you you can definitely overcome the experience part by wording that. But one thing when it, when it did come out, everyone was talking about how you you know you might need to go and buy the product and take unique images and things like that. Um, and I guess do you, you know Google could Google tell those images are of you using the product or not? I don't I don't know. I don't. Sometimes I think we give Google too much credit for being smart, but then. You see the advances in, you know, AI generation and understanding what's in an image. And then you start to wonder, like, does that also, do you also need to have real life images of you using, or if it's a hiking and, you know, it's an information about hiking, do you have to take actual images of you hiking up the mountain or something like that? I think it's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, I think, you know, for, for a while, we know that we, that we have, you know, it's best probably not to use lots of stock like photography unedited because they're, they're they're commonplace on a lot of other sites. So if you're using that, and clearly, well, not clearly, you're not using the product. But you, you know, if you if you did have the product or you were describing something from personal use, you probably would have a photo of it. So where possible, you're gonna you're gonna want to try and do that. Now, where AI images imagery sits in that landscape, I I don't know. Like you you're going to end up with kind of unique unique uh pictures i guess and that's the way you can probably get around yeah. it um and uh but yeah it's i think it's, it's a challenge um yeah 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 definitely i th i think the, the the ai images are definitely helpful in certain situations we're working with niches where featured images are difficult to find or things like that and the images are coming out of like mid journey for example for those types of uses are awesome but again who knows what the future is? Is Google going to like them or not? Will they rank them in Google image search? Yeah. Who knows yeah. on that one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess the time will tell. It's still quite new, I guess, yeah. in terms of that, that stuff. But I mean, in an, in an ideal world, right? Like we, we, we really do want to have, you really do want to have, uh, you know, hands-on experience. You really do want to have the product in hand. In an ideal world, that's, that's the situation. As we know, you know, as niche website builders, especially if you have expensive products that you're looking at, it's just not practical for you to have every product for every review to be able to take photos. Now, that's that's the ideal, and that's really where maybe you should be striving kind of long-term. If we're talking about treating this as a real business, well, maybe that is something that you're striving to be able to achieve one day, either through um, some kind of you know affiliate deal or collaboration or whatever with brands then maybe that's something that you can kind of look at longer term but I, ideally you know we're talking about treating things as a real business if it is a real business you want to have those you want to have products you want to be able to have real genuine hands-on experience if you've got an information article you want to be able to take photos of the the process of whatever it is that you're, that you're doing so where, where you can i think you need to, to try and create original photography um but we know that if we want to be in this game, it's just not always possible. So we've got to do the best that we can. Um, yeah, agreed. <clears throat> but strive, strive for the strive for the top. I'm going to skip over that again. Um, so expertise. So establish uh, that there's a real person taking responsibility for the content on the site. So this is this goes back to kind of what I was saying, kind of uh, at the beginning. At the beginning. Um, so again, you know, you don't have to prove that someone. Is an expert. You don't have to upload their, you know, their degree certificate or whatever. But you know what? Google's just trying. 
that just reminds me. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember when you finished school? That only you, uh, UK listeners, would listen know this. But you had a record of achievement, which was like all your certificates mm. and stuff. And when you finished school, they it felt like it was the most important thing ever. You had to take it to every job interview and stuff. And then you as soon as you finished school, it just went in the attic, and you never looked at it. But imagine getting that back down and scanning the pages, <laughs> uploading them to your reporter's page. Yeah, yeah. perfect. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Your record of achievement, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I wonder if it's still kicking about somewhere. <laughs> uh, dread, dread reading that again, I think. Um, okay, yeah, so, you know, really, you know, all that Google's trying to do is, is just prove that there's, or understand that there's a real person behind the site um, and not a fake person or a fake persona. Um, so, you know, you're going to want to create author bio pages, author bio pages, um, and then on any of the posts that you create, you want to have author schema that points back to those author bio pages so that they're connected. Um, we'll talk about um, the meter team page in, in a kind of later slide again because they kind of cross over. But, um, you know, you, you're going to want to have a meter team page. And this is absolutely not like 100% like essential, but it's just it's, it's nice and it kind of closes the loop. You know, once you click on a person, you could take them to then the author bio page. Um, and that kind of you know closes the loop quite nicely on on that little uh, piece there. Um, you want to set up social profiles again. You know, ideally, we're talking that we want to have real people. You know, you want to have a real person here. If that real person is you, or that real person is someone else, that's the ideal situation. Again, you know, as niche website owners, we don't always 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 want to be attributed to the niche sites that we're creating. Or you know, if we want to sell the site one day, we don't want that to be a barrier and to be linked and connected to that site. Um, so, um, you know, again, ideal world, you have a real person, yourself maybe, you, set up, you have real social profiles that you can kind of hook up on the author pages. Um, um, but otherwise, you know, you've got to find kind of some other means to kind of achieve that because, you know, this is, again, using, thinking about the bots and what's really achievable for Google, this is the only way that Google is going to be able to achieve, to, to be really understand that this person, uh, you, put, you exist as a person. And, I, and I'm more on like the, you know, the expertise front. Uh, you want to kind of, you do want to link out to any other cert certification pages or qualification pages that, that do exist uh, on the site. If you're, uh, you know, if you if you do have a, a qualification of some kind and, it, and that's publicly available on some site, you definitely want to kind of link to that. Um, something that Kyle mentions uh, quite a lot is, you know, using Google Books. So you can add Google, uh, you know, anything you've written to a Google Book to google books and then kind of link out to it from your from your author page and the thing is that you know you can pretty much upload anything to google uh, to google books it can be just a simple ebook it doesn't have to be like war and peace that you've written it can be something much more uh basic and simple so i'm not saying that you should absolutely every niche site you set you create create an ebook and upload it to google books that's not, not necessarily the thing but i guess the point here is like any opportunity to you have to show additional expertise uh, in a topic or in a topic space, then uh, make sure that you kind of link out and do that. What are these screenshots, Mark? I, I'm I'm dying to know what you where you got them from and what they say. Now they I'm keep so skipping intrigued. them. <laughs> so I, you know what? I don't even know if it is the right ones or not, but I'm scared that they're the wrong ones. I, I think so. There is the there's the okay there's the okay. Can you see that? Yeah, I don't no, think that's the right one. No, you, you can can't just see that. Them. Yeah. yeah. Then, so, so these this, these came from the uh, search uh, quality guidelines, and they look just like this. They've got the same things by them, but there's like a high level ones, and then when they go into each into specific set parts, they kind of say they they ask they 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 create these boxes again to show how it relates to this specific topic that they're talking about. Um, and I think I went on one of the specific topics rather than the high level ones. I think, but I mean, so when I first read like like this one, yeah, it just seems like oh shit, yeah, I think I've copy the wrong ones in there because they, they all look basically the same so um i just didn't read the text closely enough so apologies for that <laughs> but we'll um we'll put a link out to the, the 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 guidelines in um in the description but if you search for um search quality uh at guidelines eat uh you'll find it um no problem um so authoritativeness so really you know, you want to be thinking about topical authority rather than domain authority. In this case, I think uh, you know, a lot of people often think about domain authority and 
backlinks uh, when you think of this. And again, it's not to say that backlinks aren't important. Um, backlinks are definitely definitely a factor. Still, definitely something that um, you need to do and, and should uh, consider. And, and and getting high quality links remains important. Um, however, um, in this specific context for for EEAT. Um, you know, it's it's probably more likely to do with topical authority because you know links are something else that are covered elsewhere within uh, the Google Google algorithm and um, EAT is just there on its own. Now, you can definitely argue that EAT has some. It, there's it's, it's open to interpretation there, I guess, um, um, because when again, like if you if you look at kind of uh, the the Yandex um, leak. There's definitely some BM25 stuff that's kind of related to the relevance of the link. So not only looking at the relevance to using BM25 to not only look at the relevance that's on the page and how it builds up a profile of what that page is about, but it also kind of does that in terms of like the backlink profile as well. So we've always talked about relevant links being important, relevance being more important than you know, powerful, irrelevant links. Um, so... Um, yeah, they all, they all, all of these things kind of feed into each other. But generally, when you when you're thinking about this EAT, you, rather than just trying to think about it from backlinks, you, you'll do well to start thinking about it about in in the topical authority terms. So, and this is something that we've covered many many times on the stream. So I'll, I'll, I won't spend too long on it. But um, we're going to talk about uh, you know have you know, have you have you covered a topic you know in its entirety? Have you answered all of the questions on that specific topic area? Um, but not only that, you know, I it's, it's all well and good writing 300 articles on a topic. If you're not ranking for them, then you're not going to be an authority on them as well. So, you, you know, before you go off building out off the next um, silo or the next uh, topic, you know, you, you've got to make sure you kind of get this first one ranking first. And there's a number of tactics to be able to do that. Um, you, can, you can create supporting pages for those target pages or those money pages. And by money pages, that means just mean affiliate pages or best of pages. I mean, you know, pages that are going to get a lot of traffic and maybe a new ad revenue as well. Um, but if you've got some um, some pages that you want to rank, you can uh, create some supporting pages around those um, to help with that. Um, you can create uh, you know, question based articles um, and then link link them back up to the target pages, link them together. Um, another suggestion that Carl had, and we we also did a stream on this. Uh, well, a few months back now on zero search volume keywords. So you can go search that on our channel as well. That um, one's cool if you're interested in knowing the search volume of do pilots get hemorrhoids, which is a zero <laughs> volume search term, but it actually does have search term according to search content. So <laughs> if you're ever interested in knowing about, about that. <laughs> yeah. If you want to know about pilots and hemorrhoids, yeah. So, yeah, zero, so yeah, zero search volume keywords. You know, if you're just starting out, you're not on an age domain, you're on a fresh domain, you're struggling to to rank even for like low competition terms. Zero search volume keywords are a great way to get started. They um, generally aren't zero volume, and they don't generally have some volume, although they just wouldn't turn up in the tools. Um, but they're generally even lower competition because no one's no one's going after zero volume, or less people are going after zero volume. Uh, keywords so you can use them to start building up authority in a topic a topical authority in a space um and start ranking some pages for for, the, for those topics using those kind of uh you know, local competition zero volume keywords um and i guess the last thing to mention is you know you might you might want to consider writing articles that are you know absolutely essential to the topic even if you think they're way too competitive to, for you to rank for, because, you know, we're, we're talking about, have you answered, have you covered the topic ent entirely? Have you answered all the questions? We well, shouldn't just dodge articles that you think you can't rank for because then you're not, you're not completely covering that topic. So uh, even if you think you can't rank for a topic, take a look at all your competitors, see what they're, see what articles they've written and what they're ranking for. If, if most of your competitors, competitors have written an article on this topic, um, then you should probably write an article on this topic too. Now, you don't need to go too wild with this and write loads of articles that you think you can't rank for, but those ones, those ones, those are the most common ones, those are really key ones that, that really you feel are essential to the topic, then you can write articles, uh, or you should write articles on those too. <clears throat> and trust. 
So this is kind of the easiest one to understand, although it's probably the more painful one um, that, that people want to uh, <laughs> to admit or, or to, to do. I mean, I think Adam and I were talking before this. It's like all of this stuff is painful, right? Like nobody, nobody wants to do, like nobody wants to hear this, that you have to do this stuff because it just makes things harder. And nobody wants to to do it because it's boring as hell as well. So on the flip side though, if you do do it, you are put yourself in like the top five or ten percent of people that actually will take the effort and time. So it's an opportunity as well. Absolutely. As with anything that gets harder with SEO, it's, it's an opportunity because there will be less people that bother to do these things, which is gonna just set you apart from from everyone else. So anyway, going on to trust, um, and I guess what I'm building up to is, you know, you want to have a unique local address and, and a unique uh, local phone number as well. Um, so this means, you know, you're going to have to spend out because you're going to have to find out, find a proper business address and find a proper phone number. So now you can get, you can get virtual addresses, you can get virtual phone numbers and use those, but there is a monthly cost attributed to those. And, um, but this is something that, you, you know, this is probably one of the more important things I would say on this list of things that you should do. Now it does mean, like I say, there's additional costs that can be painful if you're just starting out and you don't have much income or you, you end up just having enough income just to cover the outgoings. But you know, the, one of the great things about niche sites and these businesses, there is, there really is low overheads. You know, we've always talked about just hosting being the only overhead pretty much. If you want to start out yourself, it's a very low bar to entry. You know, you pay, five, 10 pounds a month and, and you can get started with a niche site. Well, now I guess the bar's just been raised on that. You need to start paying a little bit more and include a, a local address and a local phone number into the mix as your um, ongoing expenses. Still overall, once, especially once you start earning money, it's a small cost, but um, this is the world we live in now. And if you want to be taken seriously by Google uh, in terms of eat, uh, then this is pretty much uh, essential thing to do now. Still a small price to pay as well, right? When you think about traditional businesses and barriers to entry and like setup costs, I mean, it's, it's, hosting might be cheap, but even a, an address and a phone number is still like, we're, we're not talking hundreds of dollars for the first year. It's still no. super cheap. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I say, that's why it's painful. No one wants to hear it. It's, hard. No. it's extra stuff to do. It's boring and it costs more money. Who wants to do that? <laughs> And, and yeah, so the next thing is uh, multiple email addresses. So, you know, if you're a real business um, and if you're a, a business of a certain size, you're, you know, you're almost certain to have multiple email addresses. Um, so you can add them to the site on your contact us page, um, add uh, one for each department. So that could be the customer service department. That could be uh, complaints. It could be um, also yeah, any, any, any department that you want, sales, that kind of thing. So add multiple email addresses, and that just it just adds an extra level of uh, credibility um, to, to to the site, and to you know giving that perception of a of a real business in inverted commas. Um, your mailboxes can all point end up pointing to the same to the same mailbox, so you can manage it easily over there. But um, you know you just want to have multiple uh, uh, email addresses visible on the site. Uh, the about us page. Um, so this would be about the company, the mission, when the company was founded, the purpose, core values, that kind of thing. Again, any credible business would have an About Us page that goes into some to that in some details. As Carl talks about, again, like you don't have to, it doesn't really matter what's on that page, just as long as that page exists and it's it's indexable and you have an, a URL that's indexed an, an About page, essentially. That's probably enough uh, for Google. So you, you don't have to go. It doesn't really matter what's on there. Google can't really interpret it, interpret what's on there, as we said before. Um, just as long as it exists, you're probably doing fine. Of course, that doesn't mean just have a one line or a one sentence in there. But fill it with something um, it's meaningful, but you don't have to go too wild. Question from uh, from Daniel here, if you mark. If I own a fresh domain related to the safari niche, for example, would it be beneficial to create posts about various animals, even if I probably won't rank for them? Uh, my thoughts are these pages could still be useful for internal linking purposes when targeting zero volume keywords. So just the first bit again, if I had a fresh domain related to the Safari niche, would it be beneficial to create posts about various animals? Even if, uh, yeah, yeah, like absolutely. So that, yeah, yes is the answer. I guess from, from what I said earlier, even if you don't think you're going to rank for these, then absolutely write them. If it, if it, if it, 
if it fills out the topic, if it's essential for the topic, I guess you're talking about supporting pages here. Or is it? Yeah, it sounds like, sounds like, well, potentially if it's just posts about, if it's a safari niche, would you po put a post up about maybe lions and giraffes and hyenas, even though you're probably never going to rank for the term lion, for example. But oh, I see. It's related to the, the niche and you could use then its internal link to your other safari related pieces of content. I'm assuming that's what you mean, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think just think, try and think about, does it make sense? Like in terms of like what the overall niche is for the site, just because you're writing about safaris, I don't think you have to write necessarily about a lion specifically and what a lion is. It's so like if you had a plumbing website, you'd have to say what a tap, specifically what a tap is. Um, you know, I, so I think just think about it in terms of what is meaningful and makes sense for that niche. Um, rather than <laughs> having to name every item or whatever within that niche and, and writing about it. So yeah, I think it's, it's more thinking about thinking about it in that way. I guess for Safari, it would probably be things like, uh, and I'm assuming it, you mean like uh, maybe a Safari destination site. So you could cover things like, you know, how much does a Safari cost? Do you need insurance to go on a Safari? What animals would you see on a Safari? Um, yes safaris in certain locations and it's probably like covering the topic that way rather than thinking about safari i might see a lion therefore i should have a piece of content on a lion um, yeah that cover it i don't know what the term is where you cover it, i guess it's not horizontally where you go the different categories but you go deep vertically so safari then hows what's why's where can you and then everything to do with safari for all those different kinds of where are the best safaris? Why would you go on a safari? Can you do this? How much does it cost? How to get there? How how does it work? All the all all the, the hows, whys, and cans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree with that. Makes sense. Um. So yeah, in addition to the about us page, you want to probably I want an about the team page, uh, or or team page, or the team page, or however you want to do it. But just something that kind of. Um, su suggest that there's a team involved. Now, on that page, you could have one person, could have multiple people. Um, multiple people is probably good if you can kind of link off to their profiles and things, but um, you don't have to go too too wild. Um, if you've got, uh, as long as you, again, as long as you've got that page and it's indexable, um, I think just having that there um, is, is a good idea. I, I guess I should mention as well, um, I didn't mention here, you can see at the top bit of the trust there, it says, is this a real business? This is, I think it's a great way that Carl's kind of thought about this as well. Carl Roof, as I mentioned at the start, they split this split this trust 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 part into two. So the first part is is this a real business, and the second part is is this a real website. Um, so so on the is this a real website part, you know, uh, you want to make sure you have like a lot of the common stuff that you should have on a website anyway. So like a copyright with uh, the current date, privacy policy, terms and conditions, you know, refunds and complaints page if that's applicable to to what you're working in, um, a cookie policy, GDPR notice. Uh, in a, I'm not from California, but apparently in California, um, you have to comply with ADA, which is Americans with Disabilities Act. So you have to make sure that websites are conform to that. And um, so you want to have that uh, that 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 uh, confirmation of compliance on the site too. Um, and basic technical technical SEO stuff like SSL is it mobile friendly? Have not many broken links uh, or four hundred fours or uh, five hundred errors. If you have a load of those, then it's just looking like the site's not well maintained, not not cared for, not looked after, um, and that's that's a big no for for Google. Um, it's not going to want to be sending people to sites that have got a lot, lot of issues. Um, and this is something that Carl uh, added again at the bottom, um, and he called it one of his secret weapons. Although he didn't really define kind of why it's like such a secret weapon. Well, I guess he did, but. He, he didn't say, exactly describe the effect that this he found that this had um, through any of his testing or anything. But he said, uh, you know, you really should start thinking about adding HTML sitemaps uh, to your pages. It just allows you know, Google to, to to go deep on the site, make sure it discovers all the pages, make sure it, it's, it, you know, then builds a picture of the topical authority that you have in the site and any eat signals that you kind of have in there. So I think it's just, it's more about, you know, this, this just makes it easier for, Google to to index a site being you know uh, through it, it, indexing and following links and crawling the site is uh, one of the primary ways that um, Google discovers pages. 
Um, so I think that's an easy one-off thing you can do. So um, I don't think there's any harm uh, harm in doing that. So I think not quite there, nearly there. So another one that the <laughs> the people probably aren't going to like uh, too much, but I think it kind of totally makes sense. Is it's probably start time to stop using uh, AI generate generated uh, profile pictures such as. Uh, this person does not exist. It's pretty easy now to detect uh, fake photos. Um, there's a there's a Chrome plugin that 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 kind of helps you do this. There's a, I know that the Microsoft released something um, a while back now um, to kind of determine if photos are real or fake. Um, and you know if you had to have a fake photo on your site, what better way for Google to determine whether you know the person running this site is fake or real? Because if you can determine it's a fake photo, well, you've kind of given the game away, haven't you? So I think um, we were talking about this before. You're probably better off having no photo than a fake photo if you don't want a real photo on the, on the site for whatever reason. I think now it's just about getting inventive about how you can kind of get a real photo um, on your on your site if you don't want it to be you. Um, so that's, that's the ideal. You've got just a unique photo of yourself or someone else. Um, but um, I, yeah, I think it's time to start moving away from. Uh, and, could, and even if uh, Google's not really following you, not really picking up on that today, like I say, it is really easy to do to, to detect. It's going to happen one day, right? This is this is one of those classic things that SEOs do over time. And you think, oh yeah, I can get away with this. I can fool Google, and then one day it catches up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just just for longevity and for now, just. Just stop, just stop using those because it's, it's going to get found out at some point, even if it's not right now. Um, and last but not least, uh, check out what your competitors are doing. What what EEAT signals do they have on their site? Um, and make sure you're at least doing what they're doing um, and then and, and then doing more with, with, with this list that we've kind of provided here today. So for different niches, there's going to be different signals. And as I mentioned, go to the guidelines, that helps a bit, but it doesn't cover every single niche that exists. Um, so um, take a look at what your competitors are doing and make sure you, you're at least doing the same as them. Um, but you've got to be, yeah, but, but doing more, but make sure you're not missing anything out that's relevant to your niche as well. I think that's about it from me. Um, hopefully that was interesting, useful. Uh, Adam's going to talk a bit now about building EAT on H domains. And this is something we've been doing for a while. Uh, yeah. When building out sites on H domains. Well, I just uh, hello to Liang. And you like this one, Liang, because we've been talking a lot about food, but it's International Ravioli Day on Monday. And I uh, thought you'd like that. And I think it's Star Wars Day soon. So, and I think you like Star Wars. So may the force be with you, Liang. Anyway, <laughs> just thought I wanted to go <laughs> <laughs> went a, bit too, a bit too far there, but <laughs> I also wanted to shout out Leanne for this because Leanne um, has been involved quite a lot in, in updating our internal SOPs for how we use age domains to build out EAT, um, which is the, the next part I'm going to talk about. So um, this really is probably, you, you should really only be using this, well, this method that we're going to talk about for... Um, oh, I got it totally wrong. She's not a Star Wars film. You know. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry Leanne. <laughs> um, but th this method that we're going to talk about here is really you can only do with an age domain, essentially. Uh, it'll become clear why you couldn't do this with a fresh domain or anything like that. Um, but you can take some of the learnings from this if you have a, an existing website that already has social media channels and stuff, and you can definitely apply some of, of, of what we're going to talk about. But I put this in here. If you if you've been watching our channel at all, what is an age domain? Where have you been? Everyone probably should know what an age domain is right now. But just a quick recap: um, an age domain is one that's been previously used in the past, but for a number of reasons, it's no longer in use. And that could be the owner forgot to renew the domain name, the owner lost interest, the business ceased operation, and we saw a ton of that kind of stuff going on through during COVID, where biz real businesses were closing down. Um, or on the extreme end, the owner could no longer afford to, to keep the domain or keep the business. So I'm going to show you a real life example. Um, and this is a domain that we, I'm not sure if it's live on the website yet, but it's it's in our inventory and we'll be going on the live on our website soon. It's called Makeup Wearables. It is a DR32, 1,260 referring domains, a real strong 
basically uh, age domain, <clears throat> and it's been around for eleven years. And prior to us, prior to it expiring and us picking it up, it'd been run by a lady called Tina, and she worked on the the website for years, and she built up a lot of additional assets around the business, which we can use and leverage to to build Eat when we build the website on there. <clears throat> so. I guess it's open to interpretation if links are part of EAT. I know Mark mentioned that, you know, when whenever you mention authority as, as part of EAT, people instantly think of link profile. But if you dig a little bit deeper, it probably doesn't mean link profile. But with an age domain, however, you're starting from a position of power. And we all know that links are important. Um, and in the past life, make up wearable to gain links from BuzzFeed and Dailymotion, Cosmopolitan, like really high authority. Um, backlinks essentially really, really high authority uh, websites but apart from the link profile it also built up a lot of what, what are called brand equity um, and that had been built up over the years and this includes things such as Facebook pages Instagram accounts YouTube channels Pinterest accounts Yelp listings uh, we see some with crunch break based profiles if they've raised funding um, some brands or some uh, age domains even have their own Wikipedia page if they got to that point in their previous life where you know they actually had a Wikipedia page create, uh, created about them. Now, while you you know you can't necessarily go and recapture these accounts and take over these accounts because they still belong to the old owner, you can leverage the the, the brand equity that was built up in these over the years. Now, the, I pulled this example out really because it's it's an amazing domain in terms of the, the brand equity it had, it had built up. So it had a Facebook page with 24,000 followers on there. It had an Instagram account with 265,000 followers on there. Uh, a Pinterest account, which still gets 62,000 monthly views. A Twitter account with a couple of thousand followers. And then this is incredible. It had a, a YouTube channel with almost 1.8 million subscribers and a lifetime view of 220 million video views, like an incredible, I guess, an incredible amount of brand equity that had been built up. And like I say, you can't take over these accounts because they still belong to the previous owner, but we can do some interesting technical stuff on the website to make sure that Google knows we're associated and the website was associated with these channels. And that goes back to when Mark mentioned, you know, you should be treating as a real business. You should be telling Google that, you know, you have social media profiles and you are a real person and you you are an expert and you have you know other websites linking back and saying hey actually this person's been in this space for 10 years they are an expert and we've got four ways which we've now incorporated into our age domain sops that allow us to leverage this equity so the first part is uh the website persona or author uh, or whatever we create essentially for for the about us page always shares the first name with the old owner. Uh, and you can check this in the Wayback pages. You literally go to the website, usually find the About Us page, and you can see the old owner's name. Now, we don't use the same full name, obviously, but we make sure we use the same first name. And when you think about it then, Google comes to our About Us page on our new website, and there's a connection there already. It's still the same first name. Um, and sometimes when we look at age domains, if the owner is quite prominent in the space and they're quite a well-known entity in the space, their, their name appears or can appear quite prominently in the anchor text. So it even looks natural then. You've got anchor text with the person's name or first name, and then the persona that we create shares that same name. So it's, it's, that one's quite simple. There's nothing really technical about that, but it just makes sense from a, a logical perspective. The second thing we do is we mark up that About Us page with person schema. And this is where it gets a little bit technical, is that we add any old social media accounts or any of that old brand equity to that schema. So in the when you go, when you create person schema, and you can do this in multiple ways, one of the easiest ways is to go to Google, type in schema generator, just one of the first ones, select person schema. And it literally gives you the boxes to fill out. But in there, you can include links to your Facebook page or your YouTube channel or your Pinterest account or, or any number of different links you can include there. And that generates a script for you, like a piece of JavaScript, and you add that to the head of the About Us page um, and save it, obviously. 
and it's not visible on the front end. So a user comes to the, the page. They don't see any of that, a, a real user. They don't see that you've linked anywhere to these old accounts. But via structured data, we now show Google there's a connection to those old accounts. And typically, those social media accounts, all, the, all those profile pages have been abandoned for years. But it's still super valuable to Google. If you were to go back and look at these ones, they actually still have in all the bios a link back to makeup wearables. Um, so there's still there's that connection both ways as well. And this in no uncertain terms says to Google, hey, we are and we're connected to these, these, these this brand equity, these, these accounts. We still are, please basically include it and take it into account as we build our new website. The other thing that we do is on the contact us page, we mark that up with organizational schema. And it's similar to the to the above. If there was an old uh, real life address or telephone number, we will include this. If there was opening hours, we'll include that. If they had you know, a, a listing on Yelp or anything like that, we'll include a, a same as schema link back to those, those profiles. And again, it's just to do the same thing. It's just to say to Google via structured data, we are connected to those that old address or that old phone number, those old opening times, it's still essentially the same, it's still the same website, if you, if you think of it that way. We're not starting afresh. And then the last thing we do is we use Yoast to add same as schema to each post created by the author, and that links through to any of the old social media accounts specifically. And what that means is now we've got schema on the About Us page, which links. We've got schema on the Contact Us page, which links. And every post that we've created where that author is set as the, the, the author of that post, we've now got author schema, which links back to those social media accounts as well. And this basically just ensures that we launch with at least a base level of EAT, uh, connecting the old site to, to the new site within Google. But, you know, it's something to be built on then. You start that way, you gain trust, or you can gain trust really, really quickly. And I'll show you some examples of why I think and where we've gained trust really quickly. Um, but you should then build on that. You shouldn't, you know, these are not your social media accounts. You can't grow them. You should still do what Mark said and you should still go and start your own social media accounts and get your own phone number and things like that and, and update it as you go. But to launch a website, it, it's proven really, really effective in making sure Google trusts the site right out of the gate. And one of the measures that we we have from that, and I don't know if it's a flawed measure or not, but is can, how quickly can we get Google Discover traffic? So Google Discover is the app on Android phones where it's almost like a content suggestion engine. You put in your preferences, what you like, and things like that, and it'll suggest content to you. Um, it's really hard to get into Google Discover. There's very little guidelines ar around it apart from, you know, do SEO best practices and have a site that Google trusts. And then they may reward you with Google Discover traffic. But it's kind of like a benchmark of, does Google trust the website? And if it does, it's in Google Discover. And I'm going to show you two examples of sites that we've launched recently since we updated our SOPs and show you that, you know, show you the effect. So this is a site that was launched on the 8th of February. Uh, this is Search Console data, and this is just Google Search. Um, so it, it came out of the gate really quickly and, and started gaining traction and traffic incredibly quickly. Um, but this is the exciting part as well. Within the first three or four days, we started getting Google Discover traffic. Now, I've never seen that with a fresh domain. You, we very rarely used to see it with an age domain. We've seen it a ton more since we started, since we've updated our SOP and started implementing these these um, these new processes essentially. And this is another example. Uh, it was launched on the fifteenth of December, and this is just Google Search. Um, and then this is Google Discover. And it's just been picked up by Google Discover within the first two to three months. And I mean, Google Discover, if you can get in there, as you can see there, has got the ability to drive incredible amounts of traffic. The normal Google search is 200, 250, 300 visitors a day. A single day from Google Discover is half 3,000 sessions. So it doesn't always work like that, but it's a good metric and a good indicator to us that since we've updated our process, we are at a level of level of trust, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> That's it, really. That's my update on, on what we've done, what we're doing. Not as exciting as, as Mark's, but yeah. <laughs> oh, it's pretty exciting. 
<laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave that just that chart up then so yeah <laughs> that's a no i think it's good no i mean you're definitely it's exciting you know, i think it's more exciting it's pretty dry the topic of eat but seeing graphs going left to right I never get bored of that um, i guess it's a good time to mention and lewis i completely forgot at the start because i'm out of practice that you're going to be doing some more teardown so don't go anywhere because lewis is going to be doing some more te teardowns shortly uh, but i guess it's a good time to mention um um, just a job, uh, a career opportunity that we have, uh, within the team. Um, so uh, for the website, uh, investing analyst uh, role. In fact, I've just put specialist on there. I've added it to um, the description on the on the YouTube channel, as, as well as the, 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 the EAT uh, search guidelines as well. So uh, they're both in the description now if you want to check them out. Um, but I think, I think um, a lot of the stuff that, that we do uh, um, in terms of innovating um our service and changing things it comes down to me and adam testing stuff on our own portfolio and then and then and yeah, um, and, leanne service. and leanne that's true and there's, actually there's more people actually within the team because yeah. i mean uh, probably, probably not aware of this but we encourage everyone if they want to and we give them all of the tools that we can to be able to create their own sites and get started themselves. And actually more and more people are getting started and Leanne's doing uh, fantastically well. And yeah, she's testing out stuff herself too. Um, but we're actually kind of, you know, take this stuff uh, a lot more seriously going forward as well. So we want to, um, we've got a website investing analyst role in which 50% of the time we'll, we'll be kind of just running experiments. So, you know, and as, you know, this is ultimately to improve our service to kind of give us the the step on um, any other kind of agency doing uh, doing SEO, but it's also just to prove stuff out there. Like you know, a lot of things that, that somebody will suggest an SEO strategy, and it becomes it becomes the strategy to do. No one else kind of tests it, and it be, and it becomes a bit of a myth in the kind of you know, in the long run. So you know we want to test out you know any SEO strategy that people suggest might be a good idea to prove it for ourselves but also we want to come up with new stuff and do new tests and and try out lots of different things so um it's a really exciting opportunity i think for anybody who's uh, interested in SEO and niche sites and just running experiments um and and trying to to find ways to get the get that extra um advantage uh, over other people within your niche or within your industry so um yeah check out um, the description if you're interested in some sort of role like that. We'd love to hear from you. Lois, I hand over to you Hello. for your for your teardowns. You've got two exciting domains to share with us today. Perfect. Uh, could you share my slides for me? Please? Oh, yeah. There you go. Thanks. I don't have control of them, but it's fine. Okay, so, yeah, a bit different um, to how these are usually done, um, but hopefully they will be a little bit more efficient. Um, but yeah, so the first domain I'll be tearing down is um, go to the next slide, please, Mark. Oh, sure. Sorry, you're gonna have to be in control. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So, uh, our first one is Flashback uh, Fabrication Limited. Uh, so this site was created by a guy called Paul Brody back in 20 uh, back in 2006. Um, he really explored um, a whole load of topics within the motorcycle industry. Um, he really enjoyed uh, showing uh, his projects he was doing, um, all from fabricating uh, vintage motorcycles, building his home, to his own little workshop and stuff that he had in Canada. Um, the site is uh, dominated by frame building, obviously the, the frame building uh, school that Paul provided, showing loads of different um, images of the students creating their own bikes and stuff. So really, really um, interesting domain within the motorcycle industry niche. If I could get the next slide, please. Sure. Thank you. So this is what it looked like in all its glory. Um, as you can see, uh, very basic, but um, had a lot of different uh, projects and stuff going on. He had loads of different race diaries and stuff. He even had his own book that was out on Amazon. So um, wait, wait, did you have really a book cool. on Amazon? Could we link to that <laughs> in the schema? Like, uh, you know, just yes, exactly. Just and wait until you see the anchors because <laughs> Pop with his name is like all over the anchors too. Oh, there we go. It's really good for this. Is the real life example so, yeah. of Lois smashing through exactly, and <laughs> exactly, literally. Yeah, so uh, the next slide, please. So again, so just starting with the backlinks, um, as I did mention, it was a Canadian site. Paul was based in Canada. So um, as you can see, right at the top, VancouverSun.com, Toronto Sun, 
um, and also some authoritative niche relevant backlinks too. So you have cycling tips, driving.ca. So a really um, great backlink profile to be starting with for this age, Jermaine. And we'll move on to the anchors now. So as you can see here, right at the top is uh, the branded anchor text. This is exactly what we like to see when we look at age domain, um, as well as some naked anchor text here. But as Adam did mention in the anchors, we have his name right here. So again, <laughs> starting off really, really good with just a baseline of eat. So that's um, tied in very, very well with um, the topic of this live stream today. So yeah, but really nice, really fresh, um, clean anchor tech profile. And then the best by links as well on the next slide. Um, also show really nothing um, suspicious or anything going on. The majority of the um, backlinks are going to the to the home page, which is right at the top of the target page. Stuff that we like to see. And then down here, then it's just all these different types of uh, popular pages. You know, um, mockups, uh, how we did uh, engine production. So lots of different informative. Um, best Buy links as well. So if I can get the next slide, please. So my strategy with this one, um, we're gonna be really diving into our how-to guide, you know, how to build a motorcycle from scratch, how to maintain your motorcycle, different types of care guides as well. Uh, then going into most popular cycle races. As I mentioned, you'd have, you did uh, actually race this motorcycles, had a load of different race diaries and stuff throughout the years when the, um, domain was live and um, different types of motorcycles types of vintage motorcycles history motorcycles and different type of uh, motorcycle accessories as well so uh, a lot to cover within the strategy and then uh, really really interesting with uh, some revenue opportunities so um, a lot of monetization obviously can come from display ads um, a little nice diagram here from our our own data project um, as you can see, we have a really, really nice clear example of uh, the estimated revenue that they could get with the amount of different pages and traffic that um, could get into this site. And there are two really popular affiliate programs as well for these. So lots of opportunity. Sure. <clears throat> and then, so we have uh, our first competitor is Motorcycle uh, legalfoundation.com as you see the r56 um organic traffic 86.4 again uh, th these revenue opportunities are really, really excited to look at so the potential revenue from display ads alone uh, obviously without the affiliates or anything like that according to our data project is around about uh 2.5k um, a month so that's really really interesting stat to see um again the page URL, the topic, key, uh, keywords, um, exactly the type of stuff we're going to be covering too. So um, really, really interesting to see the amount of uh, traffic they're actually uh, retrieving with the type of st strategy that we're also going to put in place. So we do have a second competitor, which is MotorcycleHabit.com. Uh, slightly lower DR, slightly lower traffic, but again, uh, really, really relevant, covering the exact same stuff that we are going to be doing. So. Um, loads of potential to grow within this niche for this age domain. So I believe, okay, so completely different uh, side of the spec niche spectrum. So we have the pastry studio. Uh, so it was um, an actual physical um, appointment only wedding cake boutique uh, located in Florida. Uh, they specialize in couture wedding cakes, luxury special event cakes, um, really wanted to stand out with their artistic and modern approach to their cake decorating. Um, their goal is to bring uh, great taste and beauty into the client's experience, um, offering a variety of cakes, cupcakes, macaroons, and so on. Uh, the domain to this day actually does still remain indexed, um, still generating traffic, which shows really excellent opportunity for just that slightly faster indexation and ranking when the site is relaunched. So this is what it looked like. Um, as you can see here, uh, just a little um, picture of the type of cakes that they did, um, all different types of stuff that they did. They had their own, uh, their, own, their own studio, artists, blog, press, appointments, and so on. 
and then we have uh, these guys back in profile again really really strong um huffpost.com uh 92 you know and then all the way down style me pretty hundredlayercake.com these are all uh, really really good wedding niche backlinks actually so obviously really really niche relevant to the uh, type of uh, content and you know the type of niche they were in so a really good backlink profile to start with this one again and then our anchors uh, as you can see here again really nice and branded uh, pretty much the first um, couple are all branded so that's exactly what we like to see then we have some keyword anchors as well um, lots of different stuff um, which just, again shows a uh, really, really natural anchor profile, nothing uh, suspicious or anything going on here either, which is awesome. And then we have our best buy link. So um, right at the top here is a JPEG, but really nothing to worry about. Um, we have the homepage coming up a second with 91 referring domains. Um, as you can see, lots of um, different best buy links here that we potentially look at redirecting uh, when we do start the strategy for this. Um, but again, really, really nice backlink profile for uh, this age domain. So I'll, onto our strategy for this one. So um, as I mentioned, it is in uh, the wedding cake slash cake niche. Um, so we're going to start with um, our listicle types of content about wedding cakes, you know, 20 best uh, flower wedding cakes, ideas, that are, you know, different themed wedding cakes and so on, listicle types of content or our recipes. Uh, starting with 10 chocolate cupcake recipes. You know, we can do a lemon wedding cake recipe, um, informational pieces of content around cakes, uh, best temperatures to cook a cake, how to decorate a four-tier cake, and so on. So, again, really lots of stuff to cover um, about cakes for this one. So, awesome strategy to start with. So, again, uh, the revenue opportunities for here um, obviously can come from display ads um, and affiliate um, programs from cake decorating, baking equipment, products, that type of stuff. And again, um, really nice um, screenshot here from our table project. Uh, this is within the food niche. So again, really lots of um, opportunities to grow with revenue for this niche. So then we have our competitors too for this one. Yeah, just to, just to, just for anybody who hasn't uh, isn't familiar with kind of our data project, it's probably worth mentioning kind of just a little bit more detail on kind of what, what this. Uh, so what, what we're showing here is we analysed around five thousand uh, sites, um, and you know, this is one here is kind of showing the data that we got for the food niche, which is six hundred and fifty two mm -hmm. sites, kind of in this data set here. Uh, and kind of what it shows is like you know the different kind of in the different traffic bandings, um, you can see. Like how many pages uh, that that site's got, and what the average uh, domain rating is, um, and so you can get an idea. You know, if we're using an EPMV of twenty five um, as standard there, then you can see um, like roughly what you can earn from ads. So it doesn't that doesn't include any other kind of income or revenue, just purely ads. So what can you get? You know, if you write X number of articles with a certain domain rating. Um, what what's the baseline revenue that you can kind of expect to earn? And that's kind of what what we're showing there. That's help why we we analyze kind of a lot a lot of sites. It really helps kind of help you say, well, you know, should I buy? Should I be focusing on links or should I be focusing on content? And kind of gives you kind of some different you know ideas about where you should, where you should focus your time. If you've already got enough pages, then but not enough hired enough domain rating, maybe you should do. It turn your focus to that but this is kind of um this is where we start with a lot of age domains and we kind of try to go okay if you want to get to a thousand dollars a month then you need this many pages and we need to get the domain rating of this domain up to x and of course with age domains you're already starting on that uh, you know on, on a certain level of uh, domain rating already mm -hmm. so this gives you a, a really good idea of how to uh, you know a, a roadmap i guess uh, to success and yeah this is kind of this is what we've been following for a lot of our customers Sorry to jump in there, Lois. Definitely. No, you are absolutely fine. <laughs> okay. And then, so we have another competitor, uh, Three Brothers Bakery. Again, uh, they were covering pretty much the exact same stuff as the pastry studio were covering. Uh, DR44, really um, impressive, 91.8K worth of organic traffic. Uh, again, these top keywords, the page URLs and stuff, exactly the type of content that we will also be covering. So um, again, um, 
a little start the potential revenue from display ads using our uh, data project is around about um two thousand five hundred thirty one dollars a month and that is just display ads you know they have that's potential revenue just using display ads but um they could be using a lot of other stuff as well which is really interesting so then we have our second competitor as well which is aggie's bakery dr32 uh, organic track with 22.9 again um their potential revenue is a little bit lower but um uh, which at uh, $1,000 a month, roughly. And that's just display ads again. I mean, um, lots and lots of potential within this niche. Um, their page URLs, you know, uh, looking exactly the same type of uh, content that is going to be uh, implemented within our strategy. So, yeah, um, two really interesting um, domains shown today. Very, very different, but um, both have um, a lot of earning potential as well. So... Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lois. That's, uh, no that's awesome. We got a couple of really good domains there. I like those. Cool. So possibilities with both, as Leanne says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Who's that, is that? Who's kids is in the background there? Am I, am I hearing that? I've got ki my kids are outside. Can you hear them? <laughs> yeah. Blimey. <laughs> Normally this, this mic doesn't pick that stuff up. Yeah. That must be really loud. I was gonna say it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> you you hope. You wanna tell us, Lewis? <laughs> no. Yeah, they're excited. They've got a friend, they got a friend around, so they're ex all excited and running around like mad. So. Love it. <laughs> awesome. Um anything else to add before we before we sign off and call it a day? Nope. Nothing for me. I think we're all Do we get to 35? How many likes are we on? Let's have a look. We are on 22 likes. Uh, Somewhere short. Oh. <laughs> if we get to 35, Mark, will you uh, will you post up the cardigan, vintage style? Post up the cardigan, what? <laughs> vintage style. I mean, obviously, you had a vintage, the app where you can go and buy, like, vintage clothes. I say vintage, it's just second-hand clothes. Okay. Post the cardigan on a vintage site. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but like, will you will you post up your pack up your cardigan and give it away, vintage style? No, no oh. chance. I think we should have them part of the move. Yeah, part I think of the we merch. should make niche website builder ones. <laughs> I'll give it away. I'll give it away. <laughs> we'll have to wear them. <laughs> I'm just thinking, Carl. I'm just thinking, Carl. Carl would love it. Carl, well, Carl, Carl can hit me up and uh, I'll tell him where, where I got it, and he can he can get one. <laughs> 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 okay awesome okay um well good then so uh thanks very much for everyone that joined us and um I'll catch you again next week i'm not sure actually i'm sure should i have a look see if we can see what's going on well, lois is going to be on next week 100 i'm here lois is I'm here, here next week always <laughs> i don't know who is joining me i think it might be is it, it might be dpr i think hmm. maybe I might be completely wrong. We're so organized here, by the way. So, really organized. <laughs> it's been a while. Professional YouTube setup, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So we've got, uh, it's Dave, actually, next week. So growing your digi oh, digital, digital asset oh, portfolio. Growing your digital asset portfolio with Dave um, and Leanne, okay. I think, maybe. Yay. And then um, and then the week after is digital PR, how to build topical digital PR links oh. in the food niche. Cool. Mm. Oh, a niche. nice. A niche. A I'm niche going to say niche. it again. It's National Ravioli Day on Monday. I'm just saying. <laughs> Maybe it should have been next week. You must really love ravioli. <laughs> <laughs> no, with this white t shirt on, I don't. Really yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, then. Um, right. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, catch you next time. Bye bye. Thanks, guys.